Hello. 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 All right. 1.30. A lively room. I guess nobody wants to learn anything. They just want to try programming. Okay. I'll assume everyone's online. That's where everyone is. Um, oh, let's uh, make sure we're running on the good stuff. Look at that. Yep. Stream good. Okay. Cool. All right. How many of you are done with uh, the assignment? All right. Pretty good. Pretty good. Not bad. Cool. Uh, okay. So let's get to the final piece of the puzzle um, and to give an example of one of the things that we have that we want to deal with. So we did all the way back on Monday. Hello. There we go. All right. So all the way back on, let's run S trace so we can see it. Okay. So on Wednesday, we were programming a similar style of server that was doing a different style of protocol. Uh, if we check that out, it did something like uh, the client would say, give me underscore file underscore, and we would say, here you go, underscore content. So let's see, and we were on, uh, if I remember correctly, we were listening uh, on port 8080 on IPv6. So I have on the left the server where I'm S tracing the server so I can run this myself to see all the syscalls. And then on the right, I am netcatting to 127.0.0.1, uh, port 8080. And that did nothing. Okay. I'm gonna add the dash V, so it's not gonna connect it. Connection refused. Oh, I thought we fixed this. Oh, I see what's happening. Uh, look at this. This is not 8080. This is just 80. Uh, it's because this was me experimenting with old code. Uh, so if I get that handy dandy line to compile, assemble, ooh, invalid suffix for GE. Fifty-five. Go to line fifty-five. Okay. Jump if equal found underscore. Did we leave this in a bad state? I thought this was working at the end, was it not? It was. I think you didn't save your progress. Mm -hmm. I think you fixed the GE at the end of the last page. Maybe. Okay. Well. Okay, comparing with uh, 5f, 5f was uh, 0x5f is equal to the underscore character. Okay. JE. Ah, thank you. Perfect. All right. Now let's run the server. There we go. Uh, IPv6, so now we're actually executing the correct version. Let's connect, reading, and I'll need to remember gimme underscore file. I say gimme underscore slash flag. Uh, what was it, client? Okay, let's copy this so we don't have to do that again. All right. And so we already did so far. So we read that in from the socket on the other side. Oh, that's right. We just did a, um, we found the byte that was after the flag. That's right. And we were echoing that back. Okay. So we left this in a broken state. So we found our underscore. Now what do we want to do? Because we want to eventually pass that to open to call open. So what was our point in trying to find where this underscore is?
So we have this input from the client, give me underscore, and then a file. So the point of finding the first underscore was the start of the file. So one byte, one address after that should be the start of the file. So let's see, I think R13 is here. So if I increment R13 again, we should have for certain the start of the thing. And now I just want to open that. So I go, can you all read this in the back? You want it to be bigger? I'll make it bigger. If you're nodding your head like, yes, you can see, but I always find that it's better. Okay, we want to call open, which is R uh, move into RAX2. Uh, we need to pass the file name uh, into RDI, so that's R13 is the file name. And then RSI are the flags. Uh, let's see, I was just doing this the other day. Nope. Um, Okay, I believe zero. I'll, we'll find this in a second, but uh, I've lost my thread. Okay, RDI, RSI. Uh, we'll move zero into there. I believe that's O read uh, only. Check based on output. Okay, uh, and then a syscall. So let's see if that opens it up. Okay, compiled it correctly. Let's connect. Okay, so let's check. So it read that request in. Now it's saying open slash flag underscore client underscore one slash n. Okay, over it only was correct. So why is it saying that no such file or directory exists? If I go here, there should be a slash flag. Yeah, that file does exist. So why is it giving me that error? So I'm reading a different file, right? I'm reading a file that actually has a new line character in it, right? And that's because the operating system and C programs in C strings, how do you know when you've reached the end of the file? So if you're writing a string length character, how do you know when you've reached, sorry, not the end of the file. How do you know when you've reached the end of a string? The null terminator, specifically a null byte. And there is no null byte here. It, well, it must exist actually after the slash n, but it's continuing reading here. So what do we actually want the operating system, what file to open? Slash flag, which means we want to change this underscore here to what? A zero, a null byte. And if we do that, then our, our operating system will say, oh, open slash FLAG null byte, great. So we want to open the file called slash flag. And we already wrote code to find the start of an underscore. Uh, if I was, you know, really doing some software development stuff, I'd probably move this into a function and figure out how to call it. But uh, let's say I'm kind of lazy. I don't want to do that. Um, maybe you can relate. So, okay. So let's call this be, uh, this is find first underscore. And... Oh, yeah, so find first underscore, so that's the start. Actually, so I did a lot of work to find this first underscore to find the start of the file. Did I need to do that? What's another way I could have found the start of the file? Forward slash. What was that? Forward slash. Uh, I could look for a forward slash, although I guess we'd have to look at the spec that we came up with last week, and it doesn't say anything about there necessarily being a forward slash. But what does the spec that we have here say? How many characters is it from the start of the request to the start of the file? Seven. 
six. Is that ever going to change? No, because this is the protocol, right? Any valid request. Now you have to think, okay, do I want to make a very robust system that can handle any kind of weirdness and then I can detect if there's an underscore or not or whatever. Um, but I can just cheat a little bit. I don't know if I want to tell you this, but it's fine. Uh, so yeah, if we just add six to the start there, that puts us directly at the start of the file. So this was in R13. So if I add to R13 six, uh, let's see. And the comment I'd want to say is, so zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. So this should now point to the start of the file. And I'm going to comment this out. No, oh. I'm just going to delete it. Okay, and this should do the same thing. Perfect. So still didn't work, but it did. We did properly increment to here, so that now get that back. So now R13 points to the start of the uh, R13 points to start of file. And now we want to find out where the last underscore is. Uh, I need another register. Somebody give me a register. That's not RCX because that didn't work. RSI? RS, uh, we use RSI in these calls. Uh, let's see, I have the calling convention. Oh, I had the calling convention. Was it R9? Okay. R9 will point to end of file. So I'm going to change these R13s to R9. Why am I not using uh, R13 here? And we need it later, right? We're going to pass that to open, to open from there. So we need that pointer to the start. What we're going to do is go to the end and replace that underscore with a zero. OK. So now, if everything is good, R9 should point to the second underscore. See, this is why comments are bad, because I just move this code around, and then this comment. Uh... OK. Find second underscore and null out second underscore. So how do I null out that byte? So I want to write into memory. So I'm going to move what? Zero. Zero where? Into the address of R9. Into what? Say it louder. The address of R9. The address of R9? Yeah, so I want, how do I do that in assembly? What does this mean? Replace everything in the R9 register with zero. Is that what we want to have happen? No, what do we want to have happen? Yeah. Almost. Let's get there next. But how do we write to memory? Yeah, brackets around R9 to say that we want there. And then to answer that question, if you're the assembler, how many bytes of zero do I want to write out here? Do I want to write out one, two, four, or eight? Huh? And nibble? Yeah, we only, well, no, no, nibble's too small, actually. Yeah, we want to write one byte, right? And we can do that by, by telling. And there's no way for it to tell here about how big because we're using the constant zero. So we need to tell the assembler we want to write out a byte of zero to where R9 points to. So wherever that memory region is, which we've moved that pointer forward until we got to the last underscore, and then we're going to overwrite that with zero. And now this open file should open up the file that we want. Is that correct? Everyone on board? Yeah? All right. Uh, 
assembled and built. I'm going to add this in here. Oh, why is that? There we go. Ah, segmentation fault. What'd you all do? All right, looking through this, accept, read, seg fault. Oh no. So, what do I do here? Just uh, S trace. I did S trace. Oh, this is already still in use. Still in use. Uh, oh man, that's very annoying. Is that why it failed? Let's see. Uh, process detach, piece of error. Okay, I'm very confident that this should have worked, but let's see. Okay, there we go. Connected. All right, segmentation fault. Excellent. So now we we just give up. Yes. We changed to IPv4. Changed to IP. We weren't having that problem before, so I think that should be fine because we were uh, everything there was fine. Uh, so what we're going to do first is look at the code, try to understand. So. I think I see. So let's figure out the file. We use R13 for the start of the file, move the offset of buff into R13, move six into R13, or add six to R13 to increment it. Okay, where did I set R9? R9 should point to the start of our file string first. Where did I set R9? Not at all. So whatever is in R9 is what in there. So it just started looking for memory through an underscore. Probably there was a zero in R9 is my guess, and that's why we had a seg fault. So I'm going to first initialize R9 with R13's value. Hey. Oh, so close. OK. What, what happened here? Say it louder. Yeah, we did, uh, if I remember correctly, let's go back here. Yeah, we found out where the underscore was, and then we added one more to it at the end to get to the character after the underscore, because that's what we wanted to do to get to the start of the string. But we don't want to do that anymore. Now, oh, okay, drive me insane. Am I not cleaning up correctly? That's where I should be. Okay. All right. If this worked correctly, there we go. Hey. Okay. So were we correct in what file we're trying to open right now? Yeah? What is the return value of open, though? Negative, negative 1. Is that what we want? No. Why is it negative 1? I guess permissions. Yeah, if we look at the permissions on flag, only root can read flag, which makes sense because think about if you were doing all those levels and the whole time you could just read the flag directly, right? That'd be kind of silly. So. This is why you can't read flag directly. Let's give it, uh, let's see. Let's give it its own code. How about that? So gimme dot slash server dash s.
Hey, open server.s, read only. All right, so we're successfully opening. The whole point of this exercise, though, is to read out that file. So let's give ourselves another big uh, file read buff. And then we want to then read that file. So I'll need to store the syscall, some, the, the return value somewhere. I need another register. R15. R15, have we used R15 yet? Okay, we have not. So R15 is file FD. Okay, then we're gonna call read. Go to our handy dandy syscall table. Uh, read is zero, so move zero into RAX. Uh, the FD, so move into, oh, this is backwards. Zero into RDI, uh, R15 into RDI. Let's go read, this is the FD. Uh, RSI is the buffer. I just created this. Down here at the bottom, file underscore read, and into, was it RDX, is the count, which is 1024. <coughs> okay, this should then read. And where's it gonna be after I call read? So where's this data gonna be? In where? Yeah, just in this memory location, right? There'll just be bytes here of whatever was in the file. All right. No such instruction N on line 86. Go to line 86. Oh, it's a classic uh, Emacs problem. All right. So I opened it correctly. I'm reading from 5, 1024, getting 1024 bytes there. And now I wanted to, so what I wanted to write was the string here you go slash n and then the contents. So the server response is here. Okay, good. Why is, oh, there we go. That would be here you go slash n, and then we need to output the file content. So now I want to write to client fd the file read. So whatever we just read in. How do I know how many bytes we read in from the file? Is it stored in RAX? It, is it stored in RAX, RAX when? Yeah, so uh, read is file descriptor buff size. So the return value here is exactly that, the how many bytes were read in. Why can't I just hard code in 1024 bytes? And just say write out from this buffer 1024 bytes. Because they may not have sent that many bytes. Yeah, there may not be that many bytes in the file. There may be only 10. And then we're saying print out 1024. So it would be the 10 bytes of the file and a bunch of junk. Right? And we need things to be precise and to be correct. So I need one more register. Have we run out? I don't think we've run out, have we? Was it? R14 now. All right, R14 looks good. Okay, so store. Store bytes read into R14. So now we're going to do, we want to do another, uh, another a write syscall this time. Move RDI R12. And I'm modeling this off of what's happening up here. Move into RFSI offset. Where, where do I want to write? from
Where did I read the bytes from? Into? File underscore read. Yeah, file underscore read up here. So offset file read, the buff, and move into RDX, the size, which we are handy dandy R14, uh, which we call bytes read. And with a syscall, and let's see what happens. Hey, look at that. Here you go. Wait, why is it gimme underscore? Oh no, this is going so great. Oh, 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 when I put 20 in here, I this is not correct. You can see it's it's adding extra stuff. It's actually is the, if we look in here, this is the server response. So there's these bytes and then a null byte and then the buff that we got from the server. So that's why that's being output as part of what we sent. Um, so we want to do, I don't know the string length of this off the top of my head. That's why I will use my friend, Mr. Python. 12, 12 characters. Here you go, new line, and then boom, the file. Let's see, let's uh, get hello world into test. Echo, hello world into test. Oh, that was the same one though. I wanted to show a different example. Okay. Test. The address is not in use. Okay, I need to close these stupid things. This is gonna drive me crazy. Okay. Before we exit, now let's close the client FD. Close the, uh, what I call the first, uh, yeah, the socket, the FD. Yeah, perfect. Okay, that's in RBX. Okay, close is very simple. Close in the FD, so move, move into RAX3, move into RDI, the client FD. I have no idea, what did I call you, Mr. Client FD, R12. All move RAX three. Okay, move into RDI, and this is. I hate that that's there. Let's move this here. Okay, sort into RBX. File. Close four, close three, exit. Oh, I just started to use still. Oh, God. Okay. But we agree that it worked? Okay. What's the problem with this as a server? Is it a good server? No. Why? I wrote this. Are you telling me I'm writing bad servers? It's a trick question. No, but seriously, why is it why is it not a good server? Because it needs HTTPS. 
ah, that's because we created this protocol. It's a great protocol. The protocol is not the problem. Yeah. We could access any file <laughs> on could, the server that doesn't have permissions. Yeah, we can access any file on the server, but you know, hey, that's okay. We're uh, that's the point, I guess, of this. This. What was that? Yeah, maybe it's a honeypot to see what people are doing. What else? Do you think there's somebody at Google that restarts their web server every time somebody makes a request? No. no? Why not? That's a lot of, I guess, computing. Yeah, and a lot of overhead, and it's like insane, right? We, we have a server. The server should operate indefinitely, continuing to accept connections. So where were we? The accept system call is the one that uh, the accept system call is the one that tells the operating system, hey, I want con new connections from a socket. Right? We agree? Yeah? So after I'm done processing this, so after I write out the response, I close the client FD. Why don't I just go back to start accept, right, in a loop? And that way I can make as many requests as people want. And it'll just be the happiest web server that, or not web server, fake web server that ever did exist. All right, so I can make a request. It succeeded. I can make another request. Wait, you run out of file descriptors and Ah, uh, let's see. Uh, I want to get other files that it definitely exists. What was the other one was test. Boom, and I don't even have to do this. It just keeps going. Isn't this awesome? Ah, wouldn't I run out of uh, file descriptors? Theoretically, no, because I should be closing everything that I open every go around, right? The only file descriptor that should be open was our first socket that we created on three. But you can even just look here and see, hey, this is getting up to seven. That's kind of bad. <laughs> That means that we've definitely done something wrong. So if we we closed client FD, but how many opens did we have? Then client FD came from accept. That's the other side of the client. What was the other thing that we opened? The file we want to read. The file we want to read. Yeah, this one. Uh, this one in R15, so the file FD. So we also want to, and probably do this before. Yep. So I mean, I just looked it up, and it says Linux systems limit the number of file descriptors that any one process may open to 1,024. Yep. What, what's so bad about having seven open there? Oh, it's nothing would be bad about seven. Actually, why don't we show that? That's a great question. Uh, let's see. I can't remember bash syntax. It's oh, that's right. Uh, for I and seek, was it one? Okay, that's right. Because seek is a is a command. Uh, do. Done. No seller Is it ten thousand? Was the limit you said? No, one thousand twenty-four per process is what it says here on the Oracle Help Center. All right, let's do. If that fails, just ten exit. Yeah, oh, at some point it's got to oh fail. Oh, no. It says this condition is not a problem on Solaris Machines X86, 64, and Spark. Uh, those are 
completely different operating systems, or Solaris and Spark are different operating systems. Yeah. Eventually, so eventually we won't be able to reopen any more files. So at a certain point, this should fail and not give us the correct file back. Is that a limitation of Linux or is that a limitation, or I mean, Unix or is that a limitation of hardware? Uh, oh, it's a, it's an inherent limitation of any operating system. So the idea is, remember how we had that table of like, that the operating system keeps track of the file descriptor and what actual file it is. Um, that, oh, this is weird. Um, you are you on the dash A. Can we configure it? File size, open files. Oh, this is going to take us a long time. <laughs> but while well, I can talk while it's doing it. Um, because if you think about it, the operating system has to keep some data open for those files. So in order to prevent a user space program from taking down the entire operating system by just continuing to open files, and it has to store all this data about all these files, it limits the number of max files you can have open. But as you can see, that's a setting that you can change at the operating system level to let it be unlimited. Uh, there's a lot of things like this in file systems. Like if you have the ability, because the whole point of an operating system is you don't want my process, like the server, to take down any other process or anybody else's uh, services. So you limit what things can do so they can't do this. Um, yeah, it's a bummer that that size was so large. I thought we'd get there very quickly, and this is going to take forever. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, so what's interesting is, you know, um, so I'm wondering why we've just completely blown past 1024. Uh, it's because it's configured. The, the Pwn College server is configured differently. Like, let me... Uh, is this not x84? I mean, x86? Uh, it is, I guess, even my Mac file. Oh, yeah. See, look, the Mac default limit is 256. So each system is configured differently. So you can configure it. Uh, the administrator can configure these to be higher or lower. Well, we've also blown past that number as well. So. This is on my local machine. The 256 oh, okay. is my machine right here, uh, not the server that we're using. So, all right, we'll let this run. But anyways, to fix that, we don't want that. We want to close the file FD. And the file FD was in R15. Move into RDI R15. Okay. All right, well, we're not going to wait, sorry. I thought that would be fun. Okay. But now we've got this. So this is great. So now we have a server, right? Everything good? We say like, yep, it's cool. But another aspect of a server that we definitely, oh, I want to compile this, uh, that we definitely want to think about and worry about is what about concurrent connections? If Google is serving your HTTP request, does that mean that they can't serve anybody else on the entire world? Uh, connection refused. Yes, I know. Okay. Oh, come on. Okay. I just want to start this up. One example. Uh, 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 okay, we're going to figure out how to fix this. Address in use, uh, socket options. Yeah, there you go. You can use set sock op to set the SO reuse adder socket option, which explicitly allows a process to bind to a port which remains in time wait. It only allows a single process to be bound. This is both the simplest and the most effective. So, doing what I should have done is look up how to fix this and then do it so that that way we don't have this problem in the future. Um, okay, so SO reuse adder, set sock opt. Let's check how do you do this. Uh, man, no underscore. Okay, this is where we can set, there we go. Manipulate options. I wonder if we can look at that, no. Okay. All right, 
So this means we need to, after we call this, before we bind, We're going to set on that file descriptor, we're going to set this option. Of course, you shouldn't take code from the person who's asking the questions because that usually has the bug in it. Let's not do that. I can make my point and then we should be good. Okay, great. So, okay, I don't want to do a thousand connections. So, I actually did like 10,000 connections. So, we saw our system is pretty robust. It can handle a lot of connections, like uh, 10, 24 connections. Right? Look at that. Ooh, that's way faster, it feels like. And we can see that the file descriptor numbers aren't increasing anymore, so that's great. Okay, but okay, this is. But if I connect to it on two different, so this connection has succeeded, right? This is actually connected to port 8080, but this one has not. Why is that? What's my program doing right now? We have the trace right here. So it just called accept. That returned to file descriptor four, which is this one, because I did that one first. And now what's it doing? Waiting for something to be read. From where? What specifically? Waiting for what to be read? Yeah, so we called, we jumped back, we were waiting, we call accept, we get a connection coming in, the operating system says, good, here you go, file descriptor 4, the very first thing we do is read from file descriptor 4, and what if they send us nothing? This read call will wait forever. But there's actually another request that came in that's ready. It has its request, but until we go back to accept, we're not going to be able to know to talk to that server, or sorry, that client. The other end, we don't know that there's another connection. So the problem is we can accept connections one after the other, but every time they connect to us, we're going to wait until we fully process that request before going on to the next one. And this has uh, massive problems, uh, as we can see, because this one request, we'll, we'll see, oops, that's wrong. I think that should work. Okay. I think we've waited too long. Anyways, the point being, so what we'd really like to do is have a request come in and then be able to immediately handle another request while that other one's processing. And that gets us to where we're talking about today is multiprocessing. So we went through all these steps in depth and in glory detail of calling socket, bind, listen, accept. And what we really want to be able to do, and there's many different ways of doing concurrency and all this stuff. Right now we'll, we'll look at multiprocessing, which is saying, asking the operating system. Uh, and think about like uh, anybody taking biology, 
Yeah, what's the process when a cell splits into two cells? Good, I thought that's what it was, but I wasn't gonna say it. I was gonna have you say it first, that way if it's wrong, it's on you. Uh, yeah, cell mitosis, right? It splits into two different copies of a cell and they can each do that. This is exactly what, this, what we want to do, is we want to split ourselves into two different processes and have one go back and accept more requests while the other handles that client request. And there's a very handy dandy nice uh, function for this called fork. So fork, fork is the syscall. And again, uh, the operating system deals with talking to the file system, talking to the network, also the creation of a process. So a similar type of thing. Fork will actually, uh, is done by the operating system, which is why it must be a system call. Um, and so the idea is now that you've split in two, how do you know which one is which? Because the code is executing the exact same code, the same memory, everything is happening simultaneously. So you need some way to know which is which. So the terminology is like child and parent. So that's the, the terminology here. And actually this relationship uh, forms a tree structure most of the time. Um, so the new process is referred to as the child process. The process that originally called fork is called the parent process. Um, so after the accept, we get a new syscall in, we get a new connection in, then we call fork. The operating system literally does the cell mitosis, splits us into two, and then says both of you start executing. But we need to know, are we the child or the parent? Maybe we want to watch the child and watch it grow up and see if it crashes and deal with it. Uh, I don't know. So the idea is the only thing that is different between these two uh, processes that are running, because they literally have exactly the same code, the same data, everything, the same open file descriptors. There's literally no way to know which one you are, except the return value of fork. So if fork is successful, if it's not successful, then you're only one process because no fork happened. Uh, but if it's successful, the PID, so the process ID of the child process is returned to the parent in the REX register, and it's zero in the child. And this is how you can know and decide who's doing what. So at this point, socket, bind, listen, accept, boom, one process. When we call fork now, it splits into two. And so the child will be on the right. Why is the child on the right? How do I know the child's on the right? Because the return value is zero on the far right. Also, there's nothing before it. Visually, nothing happened in the child process before that because it all comes from the same place. Whereas in the parent, the value 43 will be returned from fork. And literally, just like we, we saw, like the all of this metadata is copied, essentially from the parent to the child. So all the file descriptors are open, are the same. The user IDs are the same. The thing that's different is the PID, so the process ID here it's 43, and the parent process ID is 42. So that's metadata that the OS stores about that. So then in the parent, we can then close the uh, the client file descriptor because we don't want to deal with it. What do what do we as the parent want to do? Accept new connections. That's our whole job. Accept connections and create children to deal with the mess. It's kind of like a classic parent, I guess. So. We close it here, but because even though it's closed here in, in the parent, the important thing to remember, and you'll get into this when you study operating systems about how this is actually done. So if you think about it, this is insane. Like every time you're making a connection, this whole other process is created with exactly the same memory, but they're separate. So if you change one, it doesn't affect the other. Exactly the same here. If I close file descriptor four, it's only changed in the parent, whichever process did that, just like you can't change memory of other things, but it's actually done in a very performant way. So it's very cool uh, about how operating systems make this happen. So it goes away in the parent, but still exists in the child so that the child can then do that. The child can close file descriptor three, the original socket that we listened on with absolutely no ill effect because it doesn't affect anything. 
and then they can both uh, work on them. And the cool thing is after the fork, these are all happening at the same time. So if you have uh, a single core system, the operating system will decide what to schedule and how much of a thing to do. Whereas uh, if you have a multi-core system, this can literally be happening simultaneously. Uh, then the parent would jump back and call accept. And the parent could then uh, be processing it while the ch child uh, does everything. So seems pretty cool. OK. I really don't want to deal with this set opt, sock opt stuff, so I'm going to ignore it for now. But if I need to do that, we'll do that. You can do unshared dash one. What? You can do unshared. How do I do that? Unshared dash one and then start with a tbox session. I don't know. That's fine. Uh, but. I believe you that that would work. I just okay. So we kind of already have this, right? So we have our accept. We have our start accept. So we want to accept. And then who deals with? So we accept. Do we want to read in the request first and then fork? No, we just want to immediately fork, let the child deal with all the dirty work, and the parent just jumps back to accept. Fork doesn't take any arguments, which is also nice. What is the syscall number? 57. OK, now boom. At this point, I now have spun up I have two separate processes. The parent and the child. So if I'm the parent, what do I want to do? Or how do I tell? With the value in REX. Yeah, so what do you want to do with REX? Return value. On success, the PID of the child process is returned in the parent, and zero is returned in the child. So if we want to check if we're the child, what should we compare against? Zero. zero. And we can do a jump if equals to some label called child. And otherwise, we can jump to, let's say, parent. And child, we know is actually just down here because we've already written it. It's all doing dealing with all the stuff. Parent, uh, actually, well, I'll just do it here, but it's fine. We can do that. Uh, let's see. In the parent, I wanted to close uh, the client FD that was sent. Oh, that means I will need to move this up here to get that in the, a register. And I've written so many closes today that you'd think I'd be able to do it off the top of my head, but I cannot. Okay, move RAX3, move the client FD, which is R12. DI R12. Jump back to start accept. So all the parent does is close whatever was uh, returned in the accept, jumps back, and just boom, boom, boom. The child, we wanted to be, if we were following the example, we would want to close uh, the original socket. Move into RAX3. Move into RDI. FD is in rbx rbx all right let's watch this okay Ooh, see i can make two connections that both succeed yeah 
and where was okay I can't do them like simultaneously but boom here you go oh no That seems not good. Oh, is this because of the limit on... Hmm. Did I fork bomb myself? Okay, that was weird. Hmm. Oops. Uh, am I hitting a max number of, how many number of processes can I have on the dojo? Uh, 10, 24. And why? I thought it was a lot lower. Hmm. Max user processes, unlimited. I don't believe you. Okay. So this either means that, so I'm forking correctly. I guess one idea would be if my child is, an, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, how can I show this? Because we're in a very screwed up state where we have no, okay. Well, let's kill this. Yeah, no, not, not quite yet. Uh, Okay, PSAUX shows you all of the, every process that's running on your system. We'll do that at the top. And pipe it through WC. So I have 30 different, roughly, processes running. So run the server, check. I'm at 32. Okay, not so bad, because I'm running strace. Makes sense. Now, I connect. Okay. Amazing. Okay. Well, I wish I could show you the problem. But first thing I do is look at, okay, let's look at our uh, parent. So the parent closes the file descriptor and then jumps to start accept. Okay, seems pretty simple. Not a lot that can go wrong here. We saw that it kind of worked. Now, child, on the child socket, we can then uh, close, read, figure out the file, start the underscore, open the file, call read, store that, write it out, output, close the file descriptor, close the client descriptor, and then what do we do? So what happens after we close the client, client FD? What was it? Jump where? Uh, so after this, there's a jump to start accept. 
which will go the way up to the start, call accept, which will fail, I think, and return negative one. And then it will fork again. And then it will keep going. So I think we're just spinning up uh, a ton. It's called a fork bomb when you just keep forking uh, and call fork over and over and over again. So we want to definitely not do that. Good. So these are defunct, which means they can be cleaned up. These are, actually, the Z, I believe, is for zombie. It's going to serve as a zombie process, just in case you're curious. Okay, but I can make tons of requests. we got to be kidding. Oh, we definitely fixed that. Okay, yeah, it just can't clean them up fast enough. So you can see that I am, it is creating a process. And then you can actually see the downside now of doing multiprocessing in this way, of spinning up a new process for every request, because it's actually kind of an expensive process. And you can have limits on the amount of, of uh, these processes. But we can fundamentally handle and. OK. I don't know how often the OS like fixes these, but anyways. We can handle, uh, wow, that's like really annoying. But anyways, these are zombies, that's fine. But we can handle concurrent connections and on a good enough server, these will be fine. Questions on this? So some other techniques are you don't actually, like usually it's like a worker pool. So you wouldn't just spin up a process for every request. You would have a specific set of like 20 or 30 or whatever processes that are ready to go. And then you tell them that they have jobs to process and they don't go away. They just stay open a long time. Um, okay. Show me that that's... Am I just getting like runaway stuff? Okay, I'm gonna we're we're, we're gonna look at something now. Okay, so one thing we didn't show. Is so S trace has an option on a fork. Trace the child process as they are as they are created. So we can pass dash F so that we'll actually see the uh, child as well. So let's see. So we call accept. The accept got a four, fork this, and then we close, close, accept, read, open, Read, write, read, wait, what? What is going on? Okay, fork. Why is it calling accept again? Oh, that's a different process. I see, I see. Okay, this is the parent, which makes sense because we closed four, then called accept. Excellent. And we read it, wrote it out, and then exited. Okay, great. So we have some stuff to clean up here, this bad file descriptor, because we already closed that, but that's okay. Okay, cool. So I was getting confused. You have to pay attention to these uh, P process IDs. These will tell you which one is which of whatever they're doing. Okay, more questions. No questions? What are you doing? Why are you? Hello. Is it tank saying it doesn't have any questions? Have you seen this? I wonder how that looks. It looks insane. <laughs> <laughs> I 
it looks even funnier this way, maybe, but. Someone's got to say. Hello? Are you okay, little AI robot in the camera? Okay, now it's good. That was bonkers. All right, well, the camera doesn't have any questions. Does any of you have any questions? Any questions on Twitch? I'll give it like two minutes and then. Uh... All right, finish the assignment and then we'll start new stuff on Wednesday. Yay for finishing assignments? Wow, that was really, really terrible. <laughs>